What's up, everybody? Alra L. Avinu here with fully deconverted, disenfranchising dogma for the greater good. You can find us on Facebook and discussion. We're a community of facts of faith there. And that was specifically created because when I was deconverting, there was no place to go. And uh, yeah, several people have amazing stories in that group. Um, so if you're somebody experiencing deconversion, or you want to know more about that culture, or you just want to participate in a conversation on religious or secular values, head over there and check that out. There's great people in there and it's great content. Or you can head over to our YouTube channel, which is where this video is originating from. Make sure you subscribe on there. We've got a lot of great content. And speaking of that, today we have on the show, Seth Andrews. Seth, will you introduce yourself, my friend? Yeah, thanks for allowing me to play along here. Yeah. Uh, I'm a former evangelical Christian, uh, and dog lover. I just happen <laughs> to have rat dogs sitting here on my lap. Um, I came out of, uh, you know, a very Bible literalist kind of background. Mom and dad were pretty hardcore, uh, religious educators. Um, so it was private Christian school, vacation Bible school and all of that. Uh, I ended up as a Christian radio host. I started in 1990. And I did Christian music radio, most of it on the morning show at KXOJ Radio in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We played Amy Grant, Stephen Curtis Chapman, Michael W. Smith, and that kind of thing. And I was just a true blue believer. And, you know, I had a few doubts along the way and um, sort of brushed them off or tried to pretend they weren't there. In my 30s, uh, finally, my late 30s, I finally got serious about the doubts and started to explore. And next thing I knew, I was a non-believer. I rejected the faith of my family and culture and started a radio podcast and a website to help others sort of in their own journeys. Uh, I don't have any great wisdom. I'm not uh, a, a super mind like some of these great thinkers out there. The thinkingatheist.com is the website that I founded, but the thinking atheist is not a person. It's certainly not me. I come out of a faith culture. So we used to say, you know, fake it till you make it. And and go with the flow, feel the spirit, uh, it'll all make sense someday. And the thinking atheist was essentially a reminder to uh, reject faith and think about these things, uh, use reason, you know? And, yeah. and uh, so that's what uh, the thinkingatheist.com is. And, you know, I started the website in 2009. I started the uh, uh, podcast in 2010. And, you know, it's been all these years and I'm still kicking. So I'll put her down here so she can relax. Uh -huh. oh. She's a wiggle. But look, she's a little wiggle worm today. But uh, you know, it's it's one of those things where I'm. I came into the movement in a time when we needed storytellers, and uh, you know, I had a background in audio and video production, and so I was able to sort of fill a, a gap there and and help to admin a community, and the community has blossomed and grown. I speak all around the world, and and I'm honored to be able to do it to be a part of the conversation. So. Why is it important for conversations like these to be had specifically in so much as creating platforms like the atheist, American atheist convention, um, where you and I ran into each other at, why are those conventions useful or necessary? What's their value? It's funny because I'll see some people who purposefully won't engage with gatherings, conventions, or even, you know, atheists at the pub kind of stuff at the local yeah. movie thought group. And, um, a lot of their arguments against it are because they see gathering as a kind of church. And <laughs> what it tells me is that they've bought into the lie that the church sells, that gathering for community and charity and goodness and purpose and, and learning and all those things well, is a religious exercise. And those who do anything that looks like that must be borrowing from religion. And I think that's just ridiculous. I and mean, people get together to celebrate common interest all the time. If uh, an atheist convention is religious, well, you know, I'm going to see uh, uh, Billy Joel in concert. Well, that's a, that's church because people are coming together to enjoy communal music and celebrate a common interest. Comic Con is church. Bowling night is church. You know, we get together all the time, and. Um, we need to, I think, as atheists, stop apologizing for wanting community. It's something most human beings crave and need. Mm. I think we're better in numbers than we are as 
sort of these isolated islands unto ourselves. I mean, we, we're up against the billions of dollars religious steamroller, and somehow we're selling ourselves the narrative that we can be like the indie band in our garage and somehow compete. And right. I, I think, you know, we coming together serves a lot of purposes. Going to the American Atheist National Convention is a great, uh, it's a great example, right? They staff the uh, or populate the, the weekend filled with people who are educators who bring even conflicting opinions, stuff to chew on, you know, challenge us and get us. And, and also encouragement. People meet other people who are free thinkers, who are non-religious. So they find encouragement. They develop community. People learn how to get involved and make a difference in their own circles, local, regional, national, on a number of levels. And, and they're just fun. It's just a great distraction. It gets me out of the studio and I get a chance to hang out with people who don't think I'm going to hell or going through a midlife crisis. Yeah. And uh, I think that has merit. We should stop apologizing for getting together and enjoying each other as human beings and working together with shared resources to achieve common goals. That's just part of what humanity does. So what about the persons then who reject those gatherings anymore? What about the trauma they're experiencing? Because we're assuming some part of them, like unless 100% of them are just persons who reject the idea of community. And in that case, they probably get it and go to church very often anyways. But those who come out as non-believers and say, I'm done with this whole model of community gatherings and focusing around a central value. Um, are we to assume they're experiencing some type of trauma or what's going on there? Well, I, if those people exist. I, and there are a lot of people where religion has really damaged them and yeah. they, but they bear a lot of scars and they are, and I understand their aversion to getting into anything that might recall what they came out of, or I, mean, I can understand their trepidation if they're worried that, you know, Sunday assemblies might be atheist church. And, um, you know, if they genuinely, for whatever reason, don't want to participate, that's, that's certainly their decision. That's totally fine. But, you know, my question would be to the person who is damaged is why were you damaged? And yeah. Quite often, I think the answer comes back that they were lied to and they were taught that they were born broken and in sin and shameful for who they were and who they loved and what they thought and what they didn't think and that they deserved hell and only this sort of eye in the sky was their ticket out. Uh, and, you know, those types of things are, revolve around a, a falsified mythology and control mechanisms, mind control. I just finished a two-part series on cults that talks about how religious organizations and others, entities, uh, you know, use these things to control people. And I would encourage those who have been damaged that if you come to a free thought event with, you know, hundreds of people who, you know, consider themselves enlightened thinkers and independent human beings, you're not going to see this sort of lockstep mentality you're going to see people say well i agreed with this i disagreed with that yeah. and uh i'm going to see this but i'm not going to do that and i'm going to i'm going to skip this speaker and me and some other atheists are going to go have a beer yeah because you can have beer and you know whenever you're not uh, in a an evangelical environment and it's not a sin right <laughs> uh, it, it's <laughs> yeah. a different if it's, it's a different animal but you know if someone's genuinely been through it and they just don't want to they don't want to chance it I, I wouldn't begrudge them that it's it's always their choice they are absolutely in control but it's just i think a, it would be a tragedy to see someone live their life completely alone and isolated because they were afraid of entering something that appeared religious or that they were told was religious when really it was just a human thing humanity coming together making friends developing relationships supporting each other helping to heal after damage has been done this is what human beings do for each other not a religious thing it's a human thing yeah so when you came out were you loud and proud about it was there a point where you said hey everybody or were or did you have a you know this uh, vulnerability feeling? I had both, yeah. um, and uh, you know there was a part of me that said you need to be very careful about how you come out and what relationships you're tending to as you do it. And then there's the other side of me that, as someone who was making documentaries at that time, said there's only one right way 
to do this and feel good about yourself. And it's to do it without the shame that you're referring to, which bears upon a lot of people who do deconvert from the faith because now their community says, why are you so silly for having chosen hell? You know, um, you've left your community, you've abandoned all, and you must be the stupidest person on earth for doing so. I mean, you've just given everything up. What was your deconversion process like? Did you do it very <sighs> carefully or did you with a bang? Well, a little bit of both, I guess. I, I, um, I was really rattled at the time when I saw the dominoes really start to fall. I was reading and getting into information I'd never been introduced to before, and I was mm -hmm. discovering the world in many ways in my 30s. And I was uh, coming out of a marriage, an 18-year marriage that was coming close to the point of closure and being done, and and uh, so I already felt like a failure as a husband at the time. And um, I was, I was. Um, I don't know. I couldn't sleep at night. My gut was always in a knot. I was worried about losing my job. My employers were devoutly religious. Many of our clients were churches. I had personally shot and produced videos for hundreds of churches all around the United States. I, I didn't know what my future held. You know, I was terrified of what my mother and father would do or say everybody else. Would I lose friends? And, um, my solution when I finally realized I was an atheist with my parents was to just sort of ease them into the waters by asking questions. Yeah. You know, they'll, they'll see that I'm going through a moment or two of challenge and, and they'll understand that I'm, I've had got some doubts and, you know, it might be a nice way to ease them in strategy didn't work very well because as soon as they saw the questions, they were like, you know, danger, danger, Seth doesn't buy it anymore. Yeah, and uh, I ended up having to have you know the actual hard conversation. When I finally decided to make it official, rather than have everybody whisper about uh, what had happened to Seth, I typed. A, I wish I'd saved it. I typed a long email of explanation and sent it to my immediate family and several key friends that said, "You may have heard, or before you hear it from someone else, you need mm -hmm. to know that I no longer believe in God." Uh, and I gave some very basic reasons why, and a reminder that I'm still me, and that uh, there's no need to panic, and it's going to be okay, and I'm I'm in a good place, and it's it's all right, kind of thing. And what's interesting is I sent that thing out to dozens and dozens of people, and I wow. I didn't get any like nobody except my mother responded, and she <laughs> said I, what. Yes, my mother, and she said that I had I had exchanged the religion of Christianity for the religion of atheism, mm -hmm. and uh, I'd bought into. And she sees Dawkins as kind of a high priest of atheism, and we're all a bunch of uh, sheeple who were you know, walking off the atheist cliff, and and that was the only response. Nobody else was even curious, curious enough to contact me. Well, right. I mean, that's weird, don't you think? Like if, hey, Seth's a good guy, he's got a head on his shoulders and he's a moral guy and he's this and he's that. But nobody, nobody said, hey, you know, let's have coffee. I'd like to find out what's going on. Yeah, I had this naive thought that some people might be curious as to some of the inconsistencies in scripture and the contradictions and the immorality. and They'd want to know some of what I had discovered and they would be mm. anxious to sponge this information up so that they might embrace better ideas in their own life. And nobody, like nobody did that. Yeah, uh, that's another reason I started the website is because I just felt so alone. I felt like I got nobody. And so I'd reached out online to try to create the community that I did not have in my own circle at home.